you, Bo Young. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Well, I won't take up too much time. I just want to thank you all for taking the time to be a part of this great opportunity for us to hear. This is all to facilitate and see how we here at the State Board can support this work moving forward. Hopefully, maybe after this presentation with the great presenters, maybe what we could do is follow up with some continuous dialogue and how we can be of support to that for that moving forward. So I'm not going to take up too much time. It's good to see your beautiful faces. And um, thank you, Bo Young, for coordinating and organizing all this. So I will go ahead and leave it back to you, Bo Young. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, our first presenter is Dei Zhang from Renton. Uh, Dei, you're up. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here and Bo Young for organizing this. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about um, Renton Technical College's uh, story and efforts with regard to our bookstore, um, kind of our um, our OER concerns, our um, you know concerns around the bookstore in general, um, and our story kind of begins with um, begins in 2018 when we transitioned from a campus-run uh, independent bookstore to signing a contract with Follett. Um, at the time, RTC was losing a substantial amount of money uh, managing our own bookstore. Um, and we were looking for a more sustainable model financially. Um, there was a committee formed to negotiate a contract with Follett, although most of the key people involved are no longer at the college, including the um, vice president of finance at the time. Um, and unfortunately, the five-year contract, which spans uh, 2018 uh, through October 2023, 20, um, uh, so this year, it's, it's, it's expiring. Um, this contract ended up being quite restrictive for us. Um, for Just to use an example, um, the contract makes Follett the exclusive provider of all assigned course materials. Um, and uh, faculty and staff aren't even allowed to mention that there are cheaper alternatives, uh, third party bookstores, etc. Um, and in order to kind of make profit, the profit, because um, we were operating at a deficit, um, the current markups are very, very high. Um, and many of our students can't afford the textbooks. So in order for us to address this gap, the library had to partner with student uh, government to create a textbook access program uh, where we use student funds from our associated student government to purchase uh, textbooks directly from the bookstore because we are not allowed to compete with them per the contract. And we, then we add those resources to the library reserve so that students can access copies through the library. Um, so this is restrictive, it's a band-aid, and we're really like taxing the students twice by using the student funds to purchase materials that are already uh, highly marked up. Um, also, our current model is not OER friendly, and the only OER that the bookstore um, provides is through the Lumen Learning uh, platform, which is a paid model. Um, and it's not currently collaborating with departments that do OER, like the library and e-learning. Um, so kind of um, those are the kind of the main concerns um, of the current model, although there are also concerns around, you know, customer service, uh, not not being stocked in required materials, et cetera. But those are kind of uh, more secondary and maybe could be issues no matter what model um, we had. But but we really saw that um, this contract was uh, not OER friendly, as well as um, like, you know, the it was not equitable um, in terms of textbook pricing. Um, so in early 2021, around the time that I got hired at RTC, our associate dean of the library, um, her name is Jess Koshilam. Um, she was already exploring alternatives to the bookstore. Now, Jess was actually attending Seattle U, or sorry, City U of Seattle at the time for a doctorate in education. And uh, she was really impressed with how the institution had transitioned away from the bookstore 
model and towards a course materials reserves model where essentially the library managed all the course materials. Um, she also began having conversations about this with library staff and our vice president of instruction. Um, Jess left RTC in late 2021, but I kind of picked up uh, where she left off. Um, and at the time I was beginning a uh, certificate in OER librarianship uh, through the Open Education Network. Um, and so I had kind of time and um, a network to kind of work on these questions as well. Um, so I began asking around to members of my cohort, my OER mentor, Wade Oshiro. Um, and uh, Wade actually connected me with Julie Mayer from um, Southeastern Community College. And she's actually here today to talk later about um, their model. Um, but essentially, they added their bookstore into their library operations. Um, and so I learned a little bit about that as a possibility. And in May 2022, I presented a kind of a vision of a bookstore in the library um, to the to our instruction team and maybe some initial models that we should take a look at, including the Seattle U and the Southeastern CC models. Um, there was a lot of support in the room for ending the contract with Follett uh, and gaining back our independence. Um, but I didn't really hear anything um, for a while after this presentation. And it seems kind of like we were coming up on the end of the contract and maybe we were, it was looking like we'd have to extend the contract at least a year, right? Um, and in the meantime, I continued to talk with folks about the idea, including our new director for the Center of, um, of Innovative Teaching and Learning, um, otherwise known as our Instructional Design slash e-learning department. Um, and our new director, Christy Fierro, uh, she uh, became very passionate about this vision as well and kind of helped keep this idea alive at the administrative level, as well as um, our VPI, Stephanie Delaney, uh, continue to kind of talk about this too. So fast forward a, a little bit uh, to late January of this year, and we heard back from our VPI, Stephanie, that the cabinet wanted a proposal from us, uh, myself, Christy, and then uh, my boss, the associate dean of the, my new boss, uh, Emily, the associate dean of the library on what to do with the bookstore. Um, so uh, can we go back to the <laughs> former slide? Sorry. Well, young, no worries. Okay. Um, so yeah, they reached out for a presentation and, you know, Stephanie felt like, okay, you know, they're interested in this again. This is on their radar. Let's strike while the iron's hot. So we spent the next month or so really doing a deep dive. Um, so I reached back out to my contacts at um, City U of Seattle, uh, reached back out to Julie, started talking with Bo Young and really brainstorming like, okay, what are the possibilities? What's going on? Um, and that's when Bo Young really told me about Barnes and Nobles, their, that situation, um, their uh, kind of ultimatum or their new terms. Um, and the fact that this was more of a like statewide issue. Um, and that's when we really began partnering and thinking of, okay, maybe this, um, you know, RTC is, you know, thinking about this transition, but we're not the only ones. So let's start getting a conversation going. Let's start engaging as many people as possible. Um, and, I, and I also began doing information interviews with um, different people in my institution to kind of learn about, okay, what was the previous bookstore like? Um, what are, I started looking um, at the current contract and seeing, okay, what would it take to end this contract? What would, we would have to buy back inventory? What are the things that we would have to do? Um, sort of asking, asking some of the questions that I knew the cabinet would want to ask when we presented. Um, and then we finally did present March 7th, 
Um, and essentially, we gave like a really shortened version of uh, this conversation here, where we kind of laid out, okay, here's the situation, here's why uh, we want to explore different alternatives. And here are three alternatives to think about. One being um, kind of what uh, City U did by um, getting rid of their bookstore, um, bringing everything into the library services and calling it the Course Resources Center. That's one option. Um, number two is to bring back our independent bookstore. So in that model, we also end the, the contract with Follett. Um, we might you know, designate a different place on campus for the bookstore. We might bring it into the library. There's different options, right? But generally, um, that's the second option. Number three is we decide, okay, we can't completely go back to independent, but we're going to be very diligent um, and really go line by line in the contract with Follett and really make sure that we are OER friendly and make sure that we are um, addressing kind of the access and equity issues that we, we have uh, seen. Um, and ultimately, we recommended that let's renew the contract for a short term. Uh, they decided two to three years. I'm hoping more for two, but we'll see. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, create a task force to thoroughly explore all the options and how it might be able to be implemented and which one would make the most sense for us going forward. Um, and so I am uh, meeting with our VPI next Tuesday uh, or next Monday uh, to kind of begin forming this task force. She is going to continue to be kind of our sponsor at the cabinet level. Um, and we will just keep moving forward, gathering information and kind of like testing, uh, testing like what are the possibilities? What could make sense for us? Um, next slide, please. And yeah, so um, what I want to impart to you is that it really helped us to begin these conversations and to begin this exploration way before the end of the contract. Um, and as I mentioned, like having a, a uh, vice president of instruction that was kind of on our team and thinking about this and an OER advocate really, really helped us out. Um, also engaging uh, student government. I attended several of their meetings, let them know like what we were thinking about, what we were working on, the fact that we were presenting um, and got their input as well, right? They gave me, many of the student senators gave me stories of how, you know, they couldn't afford their textbooks and they were sharing their textbook with five of their peers. And like that information was really helpful as we are really advocating for the student um, and of course, connecting, you know, to other stakeholders, other advocates, such as Bo Young. Um, she has been instrumental and such a help throughout this entire process. Um, I mentioned um, the director of CIDL, Christy Fierro, as well, who is kind of another um, OER champion that is now going to be kind of like uh, co-leading this task force with me. And so really finding those key partners in your institution and even outside your institution that can help support um, you, what you're doing and kind of keep telling the story and keep things on the radar. And then also uh, the main thing that I mentioned we did was ask around, like find out, are there different models out there? Okay, let me find them. Let me talk to them. And that's what we really tried to do in this session today is bring that information here all in one so that we can really explore the different options, look at different examples. And now you're going to be connected with um, others who have those alternative um, models. My next slide, please. Um, and this is kind of just to build on what I said in the last, but um, it was so important for me to meet with the VPI 
uh, really early on in this process. I think I talked to Stephanie right before I presented to instruction team. So this must have been like April of last year. Um, and, you know, she had already heard about this because Jess had already mentioned this idea of bookstore in the library. Um, and she was, you know, in, um, she was in principle very much for it. Um, and she just wanted to make sure that, you know, as we presented that our argument was coherent, that our theme was coherent, that our vision was something that everyone could get around. Um, and so she, it was really helpful to get her thoughts. And also being at that cabinet level, she was able to make sure that agenda item was there. And, you know, um, you know, at that level, folks are always pressed for time. So at one point um, it was actually, this was actually kind of in danger of getting kicked off the agenda and she brought it back on for us. Um, and so having like someone at that level who can really sponsor and do some work behind the scenes and at help advocate was huge for us. Um, and then also, you know, finding out more information from all of the different um, people who are trying different things um, has been super helpful um leaning on advocates and really um what we honed in on was the vision because it might you know how we get there might really depend on so many different factors right uh budget and who we have at our institution and you know our student population what their needs are there's so just so many different things but what is the vision what is uh, principally the thing we're trying to achieve. And that's really three key things that we honed in on. More equitable solutions for textbook pricing and just materials in general. Better integration of OER, um, our OER mission, our OER processes at our college, as well as something that our students continually ask for, which is a way to print their OER materials. Um, right now, they can't print it in bulk at the library, for example. Um, so those are kind of the three things that we really wanted to bring to the forefront to cabinet. And we got kind of, we got them to buy into that vision. And now we're moving forward with that task force to really explore, okay, how do we put this into, um, how do we set this into motion? And I will hand it back to Bo Young. Um, I think that's sure. it for me. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Now we are passing it on to Zach from Centralia. Zach, take it in and then tell me when I need to uh, advance the slide. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Zach from uh, Centralia College, and I'm the bookstore manager here. We can go next to the slide. next one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just, I put a couple slides about what is Centralia College, and we can go through them real quickly. We're the oldest um, college, community college in the state of Washington. So we were founded in 1925. And we're coming up on our 100 year. Um, we have um, all kinds of offerings, GED, high school uh, certificates, associate degrees, bachelor of applied science degrees, and we support those. Next slide. Um, so our enrollment's fairly low. Out of all of the community colleges, I think we're pretty low um, enrollment and we're in a rural district. And so that leads a lot of our work. Um, as you can see, about 40% receive need-based financial aid. I would say it's probably similar for um, students who get book accounts, uh, book grants to purchase their books. Um, and then I just put our pathway destinations there and go to the next slide. Um, so this is a fun picture. This is actually a picture of our bookstore from, I believe, the late 60s, maybe early 70s. So we support um, Centre College main campus, Centre College East, um, the Education Center at Cedar Creek, uh, Garrett Hines Education Center at WCC, Green Hill School, and then we also do pop-up spirit shops at athletic events um, and other things like we'll open up the Seattle to Portland bike ride comes through Centralia, we're the mid-stop um, and we're open that day just to serve bike riders as they come through campus. Next slide. So our goals are to meet um, our Education Opportunity Act and state board uh, goals and deadlines such as posting pricing on time, um, making sure that the ISBN information is posted, book information is posted, low cost OER, um, stuff like that. We want to make sure the course materials are affordable um, and they're competitive with, I always check with Amazon, making sure that we're not like drastically charging students too much for materials, but that it's um, competitive with other uh, offerings. 
uh, we want to make sure that there's increased student success, campus collaboration, and supporting the college mission. So um, at Centurion College, we're committed to student success, academic excellence, and supporting our community in an inclusive and equitable learning environment. Next slide. So I would say our um, largest focus, and I put revenue generator, just because overall sales um, that support the store are largely textbooks because that's that's the highest thing that we sell. Um, but we have just more than textbooks. We have day one digital access, which is an inclusive access program. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, on a further slide. And then we have uh, just textbook sales, textbook rentals. Um, we offer buyback, we offer custom course packs, we do OER resources, and we have kits and bundles. And then that picture is also a picture of um, one of the former bookstore managers from probably, I would say, the 80s or 90s um, selling books. Next slide. So day one digital access is what we call our inclusive access program. We piloted the program in 2019 um, as an opt-in, and we found that students were really confused about the opt-in. And so we switched it to an opt-out, which has also created confusion. But we found that um, just further communication with students, making sure that they're aware um, for the communication with faculty, we've switched on campus to um, ensure that faculty are including in their syllabus that this is an, an opt-in program or an opt-out program, and that if students don't want those materials, they have to opt out. Um, I also make it really clear for my faculty that the um, classes that use an ebook, they can absolutely opt out if they want the book. Um, and if they are using courseware, it's traditionally more money through the publisher. So we don't encourage that they opt out, um, but it's totally up to them. We've seen about a 10% opt-out rate, which is, um, I believe, like the national average. So that's pretty good. And then as you can see on the chart below is active licenses over time. So the first half of 2023, we've we've really expanded our program. Um, so winter quarter and spring quarter, we've saved a total of 28,000 over um, just about 2,000 2, students and um, over 150 sections of classes. Next slide. So physical textbooks. Um, are they needed? That's a question that a lot of schools have, and I know a lot of schools are moving um, fully digital. We we cannot do that, I would say, because we have to meet what the students' needs are. And so um, we have a lot of day one digital access, um, but where we are located, since we're really rural, we don't have a lot of internet accessibility in certain areas, and so students really want a print book. Um, and I think it's important to meet the needs of the students and, and get them what they want. So. Uh, we also have print upgrades for those day one digital access, and they're usually much cheaper than the book um, if they were to just buy the book versus having an online and a print book. Um, but like I said, again, if they do that digital, they can oftentimes opt out if they want the print or if they want the digital, they can keep both. A lot of um, students I found want both. And so it's just about meeting their needs, making sure it's the cheapest option possible. Um, and then we also do rentals. Rentals bring down the cost a lot. So I have quite a few uh, Quite a few sections of classes on campus where the instructors will not switch their book to digital um, and they use a really old book and sometimes they're hard to get and sometimes they're really expensive so renting them out allows us to make the price much cheaper allows the students to still get access to their textbook um, and then like i said factors availability a lot of times books aren't available um, we also do buyback i skipped that but buyback kind of goes into that making sure that we keep the copies that we need every quarter um, we try to sell cheap by by high, um, and that way we just keep, we have this, um, every quarter the cost goes down if we're using that book again. Um, and then with the internet access and the affordability. So those are all factors. Um, we have had, like this quarter, we've had some instructors that they want to use the same book over and over again, and they're just really expensive. And so I've encouraged them to, hey, this new edition is available digitally. It's really cheap if you want to do that. Or let's go back in edition and find a book that's cheaper um, for the student. Next slide. Um, so we also do course packs, so math, um, pretty much all of our math is OER, but they use a packet that they can either print out or they can buy from the bookstore. All of our packets are 12 bucks, um, which is pretty cheap. Chemistry is the same. They have a lab packet and a course pack normally, and they can get those in the bookstore. Um, we also assemble kits for art, um, environmental science uses a little kit, and then, um, some OERs we do have to print on campus. Um, I don't like doing it just because, um, you know, it's kind of defeats the purpose of an OER, but a lot of the OER that we use is open stacks, and so we can get the books if they want the books, and they're still cheap for the student, um, but we can also print if we need to. And so I put flexibility on there because we just need to have flexibility. Um, it's, it's an important thing, I think, to make sure that all the students are getting exactly what they need, being flexible and meeting their needs. Next slide. 
So we can go through these quick. Um, I put operation sub focus just because we are the bookstore. So we want to make revenue in other areas and we want to make sure that we support all the student needs. So we have um, we offer school and office supplies, stationery, art supplies, welding tools and supplies, diesel kits, um, nursing supplies, backpacks. Next slide. Uh, snacks are a big one on campus. So oftentimes like during break, um, and fac our faculty and staff love it too, but oftentimes during break, like our cafeteria is closed, our coffee stand is closed. And so if students or staff are on campus, they want somewhere to come get something to eat, snack on, drink. Next slide. Um, apparel is a big one. So we've seen a huge increase in apparel and gifts lately, especially going to um, athletic events. Um, and it's great college marketing, I think, when you can get your name out there to, the camp to other campuses. Students are buying these, they move on to other schools, they wear them. Um, they take them back to their high school if they're running start. They promote the college. Um, it helps support the teams and it increases uh, college spirit. And I think it's um, it's really important when you can go out and you like walk down campus and you see either staff or faculty and you just see Centralia College plastered everywhere. I think it's great. Next slide. Um, so this is our structure. So I report to the VP of Finance and Admin and I have um, two full time staff. One is 40 hours a week. Um, that focuses on course materials. One is 30 hours a week that focuses on accounting, making sure that all of our bills are paid, um, reporting, stuff like that. Um, I have two, two clerks that are part-time. One focuses on GM and apparel buying, um, and the other one is customer service and gives us more flexibility than the students offer. And then we have two student workers as well um, that pretty much do customer service, but also receiving and stuff like that. Next slide. So I thought it'd be cool to get um, opinions from people on campus. And so Carrie Powell's actually in this meeting right now. I saw her, but um, she gave us her perspective. She said, it's great to uh, be able to purchase college themed supplies for trainings, workshops on short notice, um, wide selection of merchandise to meet student and employee needs. Local management offers knowledgeable in-person support for faculty, staff, or faculty, students, faculty, and staff. And um, she said that she'd like that I participate in institutional governance and strategic planning development. Next slide. Um, this is a long one, I'll let you guys read it, but this is our VP of instruction. So uh, there was a time when our bookstore had been managed by the same person for about 20 years and she got COVID and was out. Um, and then the, the model was we had two full-time people at the time. So it was her and I, and I was the buyer for the store and I had to sort of take another position on campus. And so it left the bookstore kind of in a lurch where nobody really knew what was going on. And so they had, um, they had decided to, uh, that they, they, another lady on campus was running it and it wasn't working. And so they had talked about um, outsourcing the bookstore and they met with Follett and Barnes and Noble and they really didn't like what they had. And so um, they had hired a manager and I came back to help train and decided that I really wanted to come back. And so that's um, where we're at now. As um, you can read, Joyce said, um, uh, boosted morale. She had me go to one of her faculty meetings um, recently and discuss all the new clothing options that came out. I try to go to all the faculty meetings and I meet with the um, instruction cabinet, the deans and the VP frequently, just on matters of like day one, uh, making sure that adoptions are turned in on time and that we're getting all of the information that we need so we can give it out to the students. Um, every quarter we do get a few students that come in and say they, um, like they, oh, my student, my uh, professor had a book in the syllabus, but you guys don't have it. And the professor never got a hold of us. So. Um, we, I've been really trying to increase the adoption rate and we get our adoptions in on time now by going to those meetings, um, working with faculty. Um, and I really just try to get out and collaborate with all of the faculty. Next. Um, so another perspective from a student, she liked the um, install clothing. It's what students want to wear, online book options compared to physical books. And then she said that she liked books. Um, if you, she has to buy a book, she likes that she can sell it at buyback for money. Next slide. Another perspective from a student and also um, assistant volleyball coach. Um, she liked that the bookstore probably has more control owning it um, and hours in operation versus it being contracted out. Um, more control over a lot of things is pretty much what she listed, more opportunity to hire within the community, more flexibility. Um, and she said nonprofit minded, and I think that's important to um, announce that we were more student um, student. Uh, oriented versus profit center, student center versus profit center. Next slide. And then this was, um, I have one more slide after this and it's faculty perspective. And so I just got a lot of these um, from faculty that really enjoy that we have our own bookstore and 
they like the personnel, they like that they can work closely with them. Next slide. And same with this, another adjunct um, faculty instructor who's uh, been online since COVID. They appreciate that we can um, assist them at any time. They find it valuable. Next slide. And so these are my final thoughts. Um, I think institutionally operated bookstores are necessary for student success, faculty freedom, and increased campus spirit. Um, I don't think that the traditional old school business model is necessary to move forward. Um, so I had read into a little bit about a shared services model that I had found um, where maybe one person is doing the same work at a few different colleges. And I think it's important if it stays in the district, uh, maybe not at the school, but definitely in the district and it doesn't go out to a third party. And then um, collaboration is key. And that I think is all I have. There's one more probably. Yep, contact me if you guys need anything. I, I love collaboration and helping out. So, well, thank you so much, Zach. Now we are passing it on to um, Julie. Um, there. Sorry, I just keep. I just You're keep, fine. I keep jumping. Um, <laughs> hello, my name is Julie Meyer, and I'm actually the librarian at um, Southeastern Community College at one of the campuses. And um, you can go ahead and advance one slide. So Southeastern Community College, it's a two-year um, open enrollment college. We're located in the southeast tip of Iowa, and we're right along the Mississippi River. So we actually serve a lot of students from Illinois and Missouri, as well as Iowa, of course. Um, you can go ahead and advance. Um, and so I would say my, my bookstore manager, um, we're actually kind of separate, but we do have a bookstore manager, and her name is Erin. And she was going to present today with me. And so the first part of our slides are from Erin. And she probably would have done a better job explaining them, but she had an emergency come up today. So I'll do my best. But um, after listening to Zachary, I can say that our model is very similar to Centralia's model, where we have the traditional on site, institutionally run bookstore at uh, both college campuses. Um, we provide materials to both of our college campuses at West Burlington and Keokuk. And then um, our college is also part of a larger seven um, community college online consortium. So we provide um, materials to those online students as well. And um, we have what's called dual enrollment here in Iowa. So we have a lot of high school students as well. So we provide materials to them as well. You can move on. Um, our focus is to provide textbook, textbooks, low cost textbooks, and um, now we have the model where we have inclusive access. Um, and then, of course, we provide general merchandise like spirit products and office and school supplies as well. Please move. Thank you. Um, so the bookstore goals are primarily to keep things affordable for the students um, and also then to reduce cost and overhead to the college as well at the same time. So we try to balance that, those two affordability goals. Um, and then we have an accessibility goal uh, to make materials easily accessible to students. Um, sorry. No, you're fine. Actually, it's fine. Um, oh, okay. And as many as possible, we try to have them, two of them on the first day of class. Um, so I do know that, and she did put the years in here, but several years ago, um, you know, I don't know when this actually shifted. It was more than five years ago, but you know, we were still doing the the entire traditional bookstore where it was all physical textbooks and things like that, and um, the margins were weren't good. And I know the the bookstore um, finances, you know, they weren't making any profits and things like that. We were losing a lot of money on shipping and returning things, and so that's when the bookstore and I was not involved at that time. That's when the bookstore started to to look at different service models and um, we came to this one. So you can move ahead. Um, so our current model, like I said, it's very similar to the previous one you just heard about where if, if we give total academic freedom to the faculty to choose their course materials. We have, a, we have a very strong faculty union here at my college and we actually have an academic freedom committee. Um, and so they, they would not react well if they said that, you know, you had to pick from one publisher or something like that. So it's, it's complete academic freedom. They pick their course materials that they want to use. And then um, I know Erin looks at those materials and if it's available in inclusive access, then that's the, the, how she does it first off. That's the first option. 
And then if it's not available in inclusive access, then we still get the physical textbooks. We still work with multiple um, vendors, you know, McGraw-Hill and Cengage and Elsevier, especially for nursing. Um, so we go with the most cost efficient um, option for the students first. And a lot of times that's inclusive access if it's available um, or like the Cengage code. Um, but even if they don't want those options, they can opt out of the inclusive access or like they can choose to purchase a physical textbook instead of the Cengage code. Now, sometimes the students, I know um, they have to wait sometimes and there is sometimes delays getting the materials to the students. So I know when we're selling things to the students, we try to make that as upfront as possible. Well, you won't have it for so many days. Um, uh, you can bump forward, please. Um, so like, it, I think I maybe already covered this a little bit, but um, if those criteria that were on the previous screen are met, then the course materials are moved to inclusive access. If they're not met, then yeah, we still sell the physical materials in the bookstore. Um, as far as inclusive access, the cost is built into the registration of the course. So that's built in up, up front to the student. Uh, please advance. Um, the benefits of our current model is we have better margins, um, especially on the inclusive access courses. Um, there's little overhead with those. Um, it vastly reduced the amount of returns we were doing for physical textbooks. Um, and we're no longer paying such high shipping fees. Um, as far as the, the inclusive access um, classes, she doesn't have to guess how many textbooks she's gonna need for a class. Um, both faculty members and students have the option to opt out of inclusive access. Faculty can actually still choose to require a physical textbook as well if they, if they want to do that. But the opt out rate she noted is currently under 1%. Um, faculty have peace of mind knowing that 100% of their students have their course materials on the first day of class. Students are paying a fraction of the cost of course materials that they used to for, you know, physical textbooks. Um, it allows for faculty to still have academic freedom. It doesn't change what we deliver to the students, just how we're delivering it. And then um, another thing that she also checks um, is when, I know when faculty uh, send their textbook adoptions for every semester, um, there's a feature in our software that checks for ADA compliance. And so, um, you know, whether that's digital or a physical textbook or whatever, um, we, we always look for that ADA compliance. Um, let's see, and like I said, if there are accommodations that need to be made, we, we do provide physical textbooks if necessary. Uh, you can move forward. So, Several years ago, we had a different type of access problem. Um, we had, like I said, we had two campus bookstores, one at our larger campus, West Burlington, and one here at Keokuk, um, where I work, which is the smaller campus. And our bookstore associate, it was only staffed by one person full time. She retired in May of 2018. And um, administration made the decision not to replace her, uh, just you know, because of salaries and things like that, they were, everybody's looking at cost savings right now. Um, and so they wanted to try operating the entire college with just one bookstore. And so for the next three years, that's how we operated. And the Keokuk, primarily, the Keokuk bookstore was only open like the first two to three weeks of a semester. And the students would come in and get their books and or most of them would get their books but we had a lot of difficulties with this you know because we have we have different start dates for some of the classes and so the bookstore at our campus would then be closed before the next start date for classes so then those students were either having to travel up to west burlington um, and we're in a rural community and my county especially lee county um, is very poor. Um, a lot of our students are very poor and they, a lot of them have transportation issues. So just traveling to the other campus to get um, those materials was a problem. And um, if they ordered them online, then they have to pay shipping charges. And that's another cost to the students. Um, and so students had a lot of problems getting course materials um, that they needed. And then there was also, there was no supplies or apparel to them on our campus throughout the rest of the semester. So you know, administration 
they heard a lot of complaints um, from my campus, from our students, um, and and they listened, and I'm very glad that they listened. So if you want to move forward. And so they, in spring of 2021, they actually uh, came to me and we started to discuss merging the bookstore operations with the library. And um, this had actually been proposed previously when the when the books when they made the decision to close our bookstore. And at the time, we couldn't really come to an agreement. My supervisor and the bookstore supervisor. Um, so my supervisor is the vice president of academic affairs, and then the bookstore supervisor is the CFO. And they kind of had different visions of how this merger would take place several years ago, and so it, it just fell apart. And that's when they decided not to have a bookstore for three years. And so this time when we came back to the table with discussions, I think everybody was, including myself, was much more open to um, how can we make this work? Because we do need to, to provide these services to our, our students for their success. Um, it had become a, you know, removing the bookstore had made a barrier for student success on our campus. And so we, we had to remove that barrier. And so we started um, discussions and um, our goals were to return the bookstore services to the campus full time, keep the cost of the college low by using existing library staff, and so some of the things we had to do was, of course, we had to revise job descriptions. So I have two library staff, one full-time during the day and one part-time in the evenings. We had to revise their job descriptions. And, you know, there were a lot of things and there were some things in their job descriptions that really were no longer relevant to how we, were, how we are currently operating the library. Um, and so we removed those job duties um, and we were able to gain Two full time library bookstore associates in doing that, you know, by combining these duties. Um, and my goal, especially in my VPAA goal, um, we wanted to keep the bookstore footprint in the library small. So, like, you know, a lot of times your bookstore is really busy at certain times of the year, and then it's, it's empty a lot of times of the year, you know or um, you have empty shelves because your books have already been bought and now you've done your returns. And we didn't want to add emptiness to parts of the library. So we wanted to keep our, our footprint small. And so we decided that the way we would do that is we would only make a few renovations and we would primarily put displays of things on the wall for apparel. And we would keep the textbook stock and the apparel stock in our, our back storage room. Um, would you move forward one, please? And so the only library renovations we really had to do was we had we had two um, entrance doors at the front of the library and we ended up removing one of those doors because um, it just wasn't needed anyway. And that way we were able to expand our library counter out, give us some more workspace and more um, also area behind the desk so we could add these flat boards that you'll see in a picture later. Um, so we could put the apparel displays on the boards on the walls um, behind the library uh, counter. Um, and then in the back room, we did get new shelving for textbooks and the apparel to sit on. And we went with some really heavy duty shelving um, that you get like at Lowe's or whoever your hardware store is. Like it's like heavy duty garage type of shelving. It's great. Um, because like even like the shelves in our previous bookstore, you know, they were the wooden shelves and they would kind of warp and stuff under the weight of the books. So they won't do that now, um, if you want to move forward. So these are two uh, pictures. Um, so in the first one, you can see this is our new library counter and how we've uh, displayed our apparel and um, some of our items that we have for sale. Um, so another thing that we limited was um, when we were in discussions, we had to talk about what supplies we would sell, and we limited it to very basic um, necessary supplies. Um, so we, we have a small selection of apparel and spirit items, very basic necessary uh, school supplies are, are available. Um, and we pretty much all have that behind the library counter. And then in the back room um, with this shelving that I was talking about, we keep all the stock in those boxes of the apparel um, and so like when a student comes and they would like to get um, the red t-shirt, they tell us what size they want to see and we come back and we grab the t-shirt for them and 
um, if it's not the right one or they want to see a different size, you know, we go get it and, and that's how they purchase the apparel. Um, same thing kind of thing with the textbooks. Students come in with their class list and we go back and we actually pull the textbooks for the students. And that's a little different than the traditional bookstore models. Um, but we didn't have the space, like I said, to, to put it out here in the library for it to be accessible to them. And so it's, it's more work, I would say, on my life, on the library assistant to do the majority of the sales. It's more work on their part, but it's actually benefited us in ways like with less returns of items um, and things like that. So if you want to move forward. Um, so here are some of the opportunities and challenges that we, we went through. Um, let me go through the challenges first. Um, even though we all wanted to make this work, you know, change is difficult. And so there was still, um, a, you know, a staff that struggled with some of the physical changes that we were making in the library. Um, and then some policy changes that we, we also had to make in with security of items and things like that. So, um, you know, there, there was definitely an adjustment period um, and we had to be sensitive to, to that. Um, training and know-how, um, that's been difficult. Like I said, so the bookstore manager is actually located at the West Burlington campus and, and her staff and she are obviously well trained in all of these different scenarios and things like that. Um, and she, of course, came down and she provided us training on how to, you know, do the sales and things like that. But then you get into your selling season and there's all kinds of scenarios that come up, especially with like financial aid and other things that um, we would find ourselves calling her about or calling just the other bookstore about. And they were they were wonderful and very gracious about always answering our questions and things like that. But there's that you can do the training, but there's a lot of just extra know-how that doesn't come until you've done until you've experienced it, you know, those those sales and things like that. Um, and then the coordination and timing of certain library processes and bookstore processes, I've had to kind of um, you know stagger some of my processes out. Um, so like, I don't wanna be buying and cataloging a lot of books during the time when we're busy with bookstore sales and things like that. So it's just been a little bit of adjustment in um, library processes to accommodate for bookstore, busy times for the bookstore. Um, as far as opportunities, um, the big thing was, um, this was an opportunity to, to fill a need for our students. Like I said, remove a barrier to success. Um, it was an opportunity to increase student traffic to the library. You know, once we make a connection with students, they're more likely to come back. So we saw that as an opportunity. Um, it was also an opportunity to uh, look at our library space and declutter and discard materials that were no longer being utilized. Um, and actually, um, our administration was so happy that we were willing to take this on that they went ahead and painted my whole library. Um, and even gave us some new flooring. So there were some, some extra benefits there as well. Some, so that was nice. Um, and I, did I have one more slide or was I done? Okay, and then so just the benefits. Um, oh, as far as to the college, it also gave a better utilization of space overall because the old bookstore was able to be turned into a classroom. Um, like I said, it saved the college money by utilizing existing employees it increased library staff productivity by removing old duties that were no longer necessary and replacing them with bookstore duties. Um, our bookstore is actually open now more than the, the bookstore at the, uh, at the larger college campus because we're, we were able to open be open in the evening as well, um, having a part-time person in here in the evening. And our students, the biggest benefit, our students once again have full-time on-site access to bookstore services. So. Um, feel free to contact me with any questions. I didn't provide my information, but I'm sure Bo Young will provide that. Um, and she also had me write out like a longer narrative and she's gonna provide that as well. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, next, we are moving um, on to Peninsula. Sorry, Camilla, you're up. Hi there, my name is Camilla Rico and I'm the Director for Community Education and Enterprise Services. 
Um, we are a regular institutional bookstore, um, but we do have a deep focus on low cost um, options for our students. I'm going to try to run through this really quick because I think we're a little behind schedule. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Peninsula College is a small geographically um, remote college located in Port Angeles. Uh, Peninsula College has taken an active part in supporting low-cost efforts since 2010. Uh, when I was hired 11 years ago, the main goal written into my job description um, was to lower textbook costs for students, um, which was pretty remarkable at that time. Um, so I was very excited. By 2015, we had saved students over a million dollars. Um, we have always operated on a skeleton crew. Um, and today, the campus store still has a very small footprint and is operated by one assistant manager and two part-time employees. The campus store provides course materials to Port Angeles campus, Forks campus, and Port Townsend campus, but we only have a physical location at the Port Angeles campus. And we um, basically do drop ships to Forks campus and Port Townsend campus and the um, campus um, employees there hand out the materials to students so they don't have shipping costs. Um, the bookstore also has clothes, snacks, electronics, water bottles, welding tools, backpacks, anything else you can think of that we can cram into a small space. Uh, but mostly today I'll be focusing on course material in this very short presentation. Next page. The primary goal of the Buccaneer is to ensure student success through opportunity and accessibility of materials. We strive to provide the right course materials at the best price when students need it. Um, so we do this by providing course material information at the time of registration, providing the actual course material as early as possible, but at least 30 days prior to class. Um, we support and facilitate low cost and no cost classes. We use creative sourcing for every faculty adoption we receive, and I'll explain a little more about that in the next slide. We clearly label low cost and OER classes in CTC link and on our website. Next page. Every faculty adoption we receive is evaluated for low cost option. Um, so I mentioned that we use creative sourcing for every faculty adoption, and that really just means that we look for all the low cost options for every book, and then we provide all those options to the students. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we do offer. Um, there's more, but these are the main ones. Um, used books, so we provide regular used books. Um, and then when we can, we also use creative sourcing, and that means that we acquire used textbooks at the lowest possible price, and then we turn those savings over to the students. Um, so we are the pirates at Peninsula College, so um, we used to smartly call it plunder prices before, but we've now just rolled it into all of our low-cost options. We also provide course packs and kits for classes. Um, if we can lower the price by providing it in a course back for materials, we will. If we can't lower the prices, we will not. Um, ebooks, every time that we can provide an ebook or a rental option, we do so. Um, I would venture to say about 90% of our regular books also have ebooks or rental options, excluding bundles, because um, bundles are textbooks bundles with homework, software, and access codes, and they can be very hard to provide low cost options for. Um, we also do course fee program or inclusive access, which other people have talked about today. Um, it's a textbook embedded into Canvas or an access code, and it can significantly lower the cost of an adopt-in book. We only provide it if the instructor wants it. Um, it, you know, it, it charges a student a fee at the registration when a student registered, and uh, some financial aids can pay for it, so it's pretty beneficial. Um, but because it's a learning curve sometimes for our instructors, we don't make them um, use that option. Um, we let them choose. Um, so because it's based on what the instructor wants each quarter, it varies. But overall, we have about 10% of our classes are um, using IA. And our opt-out rate for our students is about 1%. Um, so most students seem to appreciate it when it's offered. Um, 
inclusive access is one of the few options that we have to lower costs for instructors that choose to use bundles. Um, so that is often one that we will try to focus on when we talk to instructors is here's an option. If you still want to use this access code and an ebook, we can um, use inclusive access to lower the price a little bit. And then we try to have a couple of OER print options for every single OER book that we have. Um, so students that need it are able to get a physical book if they want it, and those prices are pretty low. We also have web compare prices on our campus store website for complete transparency. Um, that shows the lowest price on the web from places like Amazon or um, other providers. And so if we don't have the lowest price, students can confidently purchase it from somewhere else. Um, and it's giving the student the best options that work for them. Next page. Um, last year, our average course material price per course was $46.50. Um, that includes nursing bundles, chemistry books, everything like that. Um, and our fact, when we're factoring in, it does not include um, classes that don't normally have a textbook, like internships, yoga, that kind of stuff. 43% uh, of our classes were labeled low-cost textbooks, and that is $50 or less. 12% were OER um, classes, and that's free classes. And again, that's using the same model. We're not looking at things like internship or yoga, things that traditionally don't require a textbook. Uh, next page. So some of the differences or benefits of what we um, do at Peninsula College that I can see is we are we support students, we give them the options, and that's really the focus that we um, have. We have walk-in, you can order online, um, we support all the different financial aid options. Uh, we have an intense focus on lowering textbooks costs, which breaks down barriers to student success. Um, it does require a shift in thinking from Bookster being a profit center to more of a service, and that's the thinking that has to happen from up top. Um, that doesn't mean that we can lose sight of being a self-support. I mean, we still have to break even, um, so it's a balancing act. Um, we really focus on supporting faculty. The Bookster reports to the VP of Instruction. Um, at our institution, that is fairly new. That's something um, that changed not that long ago, but I can already see um, that it will help us work um, even closer with instruction, and we can naturally build some of those relationships with the faculties and deans. Um, and it keeps the bookstore informed and included when we're making different decisions on campus. And, um, you know, so I think that is, has been really helpful. The bookstore handles all of the labeling, which saves Peninsula College from doing double work. The bookstore is using information that they're already collecting, and they are um, getting all that information together, and they're labeling it in CTC link. And when we have issues or when we need to communicate with faculty, um, we already have those connections. We've already talked about the materials that they're using, and so it's really easy for us to reach out and um, get that information. Um, so my focus here has mostly been on affordability. Next page, please. But I just want to show we do do other things. Um, we have fun things in the bookstore too, and we show up to events, and we even did home deliveries for all textbooks during COVID for every student, um, which was exciting. Um, but um, if you have any questions, Boyang will um, share my information, and I'd be happy to share it with you guys. And um, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Camilla. We have. Um, last but not least, um, Carolyn from mm -hmm. Seattle University. Thank you so much for <laughs> waiting <laughs> yeah, until no problem. The, <laughs> and then I, and then this is a really good portion. I hope you, you all stay um, through this yeah, I uh, hope, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I hope people can stay. My name is yeah. Carolyn. I'm from City University of Seattle, and we don't have a bookstore, so I crossed out the bookstore part. Um, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> This might be the most complicated model, or it or might be not most complicated, but needs the most setup, um, but it's worth it. So we're a private not-for-profit. We're primarily online, but we do have some on-site courses. Um, we have international offerings, but we're fairly small with um, 3,500 students. We also have kind of less offerings than a traditional community college might have. We have business education counseling and some technology, but we don't have like trades or nursing, which would require other materials. Um, next slide. 
So in 2020, um, our physical site closed like many others, but we the library never fully reopened with staff. Um, all the library services are online only and we work from the US and Canada. 98.3% of the collection is online, <clears throat> which will include textbooks and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so we don't have a lot of bookshelves, a lot of things that students can come and see um, in person at the campus, which has reopened since then. Um, we're a really small team. We have three reference and instruction librarians. Um, I am one of them, uh, one director, a systems librarian, a course resources coordinator, and a library tech. So fairly small. Um, next slide. And we have a centralized curriculum. So all of the courses and the reading lists are based on a master list shell system. So we create master reading lists for all of the resources, master shells for courses, and um, those are all designed by teams and they all go through a centralized curriculum council. So the key to this is that librarians sit on all of those development teams uh, with an instructional designer and the subject matter expert and we create those reading lists during that development process. So we have, um, in that way, we have, we know what all of the resources will be um, recommended and required for all of the courses. And then faculty, program managers, program directors, which are in charge of courses, um, update their lists as they go, as courses are updated. Um, and librarians sit on the curriculum council as well. So this role on our team gives us some insight in what faculty need, what they want to use for their courses, but it also helps us advocate for low cost resources and OER. And so when we discuss resources that they want to use in, their, in the courses, we do a lot of research for them, recommend library resources, OER, online resources. And we also talk about cost. If they choose a very expensive textbook, we have some insight. Um, faculty and the subject matter experts do have kind of that ultimate decision at the end. They can choose physical textbooks or softwares and things that you know they need for their courses, but we always have kind of a conversation about it within these teams that we're on. Um, next slide. So our focus in being involved at this level is accessibility and affordability. So we use Leganto for our reading lists, which is um, software. And all of the lists are published on a set schedule so that students know what their resources are. Every resource that is used in a class um, will be on that Leganto list, whether it's required or recommended. Um, and I'll show you some images later. Students know now to check their lists ahead of the quarter. We publish um, a month before the courses start, so students have time to buy physical materials if they need to, and um, they can prepare to make sure that they have the access they need to open library materials or online materials. Um, so for affordability, all of the librarians review the reading lists. Um, before the quarter starts, we pull reports of all of the required purchases for students, and we go through our purchasing system, which is Rialto, to see if we could offer any ebooks. Any ebook that has an unlimited license or non-linear license, if we need to, is purchased by the library. And so every textbook that we can offer to students, we do. Um, and then the Leganto lists are updated with those links. So every item that is available for students is on that Leganto list with a link to the resource that connects directly to the catalog. And so they can see right away um, what their book is, they can open it, they can see what the downloading rules are. Um, we all know that ebook licenses have all kinds of different rules and stipulations for printing and downloading. So students can prepare um, in advance. And then, um, yeah, when we design the courses, we promote those resources as well. We can do that research in our purchasing system. If a faculty member wants to use a book that we don't have in the collection, we can give them advice right away and tell them if it can be purchased, what the licenses would be like, what integration into the course would look like. Um, next slide. 
So Loganto is the system that we use. It displays all of the resource information, including uh, required and recommended. You can organize it kind of any way that you want, but we organize it in um, a top section with all of the required materials, whether they're from the library or whether students need to purchase them. And that just makes it clear to students uh, which items they will need for the duration of the course. So the required materials are typically things that they'll use throughout the 10 weeks of the course or that they're going to use often and refer back to. Um, like certain software, like SPSS, for example, or, um, you know, the, a, a textbook. And then Loganto provides that direct link to the library with um, their links or any of the online materials. We add tags so that students know if something is required or recommended. Um, you can add notes as well, kind of explaining, like if the library doesn't have it, um, we do have some courses that use like my lab, for example, we will, we can add a note saying like my lab is required for this course, you know, please purchase from the publisher, things like that. So it's really flexible in what you tell the students. Um, for our catalog and purchasing, we use Alma, Rialto, Summon. Um, and that provides the connection between Leganto and our collections. So all the citations are held in Alma, but they can be created in Leganto by faculty, by program directors, or by the librarians, and then that connection is made. Um, Summon, which is our catalog, displays the items in the library catalog and tells the students if they're used in a course. So if a student searches for a textbook, they will see which course it's offered in in the catalog. And then we use um, Rialto for purchasing, which we actually just got. So we're still working through some of those features that they have, but they have a request system um, and it's a really streamlined process for purchasing. Um, next slide. So here's an example of a one of our reading lists through Leganto. You can see that required section. These are the two items that students will need to buy for that course. Below this, you might see some other sections, which I have on, on the next slide, but you can see the tags. So this is a required item. It's available through the City U Library. So when they click on that, they will be taken to a secondary page that has more information about the book, like the ISBM, um, all kinds of other things, and a link to the database in which it's held. Um, the reason we have it like that is because some books or articles are held in more than one database. And so um, students can choose based on accessibility or different features, or it helps um, if links break or aren't connecting properly. And then you can see one that students need to buy. So we have purchase from a vendor you choose. So we don't have a bookstore. So students can choose um, where they wanna purchase it. And that's the note we have there. It's also required. Um, this is an internal tag for our statistics. Um, collaborators are people who have access to the list. So program managers, SMEs, students can add comments. Um, it's not used a lot right now, but you know it might be later. Library discussion, um, people can leave us notes here. Students can report broken links. There's, there's all kinds of cool features in Leganto. And um, the student savings, the sticker price is how we calculate our savings for students. So the total price for the class is $113. We cover 70, which is the sticker price. So their cost is only $43. Um, we can talk about savings a little bit as well. Next slide. So below that required section, you can have sections for each module of every week or week one, week two, you can name it by topic, um, but this is how we organize it. They also have tags telling students you will be required to watch this video in module three. So any kind of resource can be added to Leganto. Um, so it's really flexible that way. Next slide. And this is what the catalog looks like. If a student checks for you know, a certain book they're using in the class, they can see which courses it's being offered in. Um, I'll skip the rest, so next slide. So the benefits, um, our library covers 60%, 61% of all required books in, at the institution. Uh, freely accessible resources make up 86% of required resources. So that's anything that's online, accessible for free, websites, that kind of stuff, in addition to the library. Um, we're working a lot on the price and the savings for students. Our estimate right now is about 1 million annually that we're saving students. Um, and if you wanna know more about that, I, I recommend you contact 
our, our team. So all of the resources are centrally located. So all the information for all the courses are in Leganto and students know that, faculty know that, it's a good kind of reference for them. The lists are required. You can't offer a class without having a reading list. So nothing in theory gets forgotten. Um, there's a direct link in our LMS in Brightspace. So at the top in the navigation menu, they have a library tab and a reading list tab. So when they click on that read us, reading list button, they get taken directly to their reading list for that course. And that one is editable by their faculty. So if certain faculty members want to switch out some articles um, or add you know, relevant readings, they can do that. They're not allowed to remove required resources that students may have bought. Um, so that's kind of our only rule there. Um, it provides us quick access to fix broken links or access issues. So if anything goes wrong, we can quickly fix them in the back end and it gets distributed everywhere. Um, students source their own books, which is also on my challenge slide. So there's no bookstore, so they kind of have to, they can shop around for deals, which can be really good. Um, it's also really flexible if students don't want an ebook, they can still buy a print book. That's something that they can choose, but we offer the ebooks for free. Um, or if students, you know, need different formats or, or that kind of thing, it's, it's flexible that way. Um, it's also flexible if you don't have all the required readings. There are ways that to set up Leganto where faculty just set up their own lists and put their readings there. So you don't have to have this system to make it work. Um, next slide. So some of the challenges have been um, maybe not so much buy-in since the lists are required, but the process for getting the resources to us in a timely way or editing the lists in a timely way. Um, that's something that we continually work on and listen to feedback about, but that has been a bit of a challenge. Some of the training as well, it's really time consuming to train um, everyone essentially at the institution how to use the lists. Um, and that, that can lead to errors. If they don't update the list on time, then there might be an error in the course. Um, so staffing and management of the list has been a lot of work for us. And we're working on, you know, getting some graduate assistants, student workers up to date on reading lists or automating some of the process. Um, we've been able to do that. And then um, some of the challenges for students are overwhelming reading lists, putting too many things on the reading lists. Um, that can be confusing for students if they're not organized in those sections. And then the, the last challenge that we already discussed, um, some students might find it difficult to find their own books or they're not confident that they have the right book or the right edition. But we use, um, we talk to students quite a bit through our chat system and we can always help them gu and guide them to purchasing their own books. And next slide, I think that's it. Um, you can always contact me. Um, my systems librarian is here as well, and I think my boss might be here as well, the director of the library. So if you have any questions, you can email us or put them in the chat. We also have a direct link to Leganto, which is uh, technically open. So if you, you know, want to look around, see how we organize lists, see what's on there, you can use this link there. I think that's it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> going well, fast <laughs> thank you you know thank you so much um you know thank you all once again for joining us today and as we emphasized earlier today's session was all about sharing what's happening and learning from one another and we are so grateful for our amazing guest speakers today who generously shared their valuable time knowledge and resources with us and i really apologize that we uh, didn't have a time to do a q a but i see that several questions have been already answered on the chat by the guest speakers thank you again for doing that but some of the questions that were unanswered uh, you're welcome to reach out to them if you have any further questions so uh, the link to this um, slide and the recording of this webinar will be sent out to the system with the subtitles, of course. And thank you so much for participating. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.